All right, so continuing our study in Mark chapter 12 this morning, having kind of given us a synopsis already of, of the theme of the chapter and what Jesus is teaching and instructing us in the text, we, we will see today two types of disciple. Now, one is a good example, and the second one is, uh, well, it's, it's not, not a good example. And again, in my life, I think it's helpful for me to see an example of what, it, what, what is expected. Right now in spring training all over the southern states of uh, this good country, baseball teams have gathered, and one of the things they do is they bring ball players who have been in an organization, they come down and they help with the young guys to know what, what it looks like to be a major league ball player how you carry yourself, how you interact with the fans, how you interact, how you, how you interact with the other team, how, how you handle it on the field, the way you go about doing these things. And, and they do that because those young guys need an example to follow. Well, that's good for us as well, and Jesus knew that. And as he's, the, the questions have been concluded, no one's asking any more questions. The crowd understands that Jesus is calling his disciples, in a sense, to give their all. I think it's helpful for us and for the crowd that day, and Mark gives record that we would have an example. What does that look like? So again, this morning, two types of disciples are illustrated in our text this morning. Verse number 38, we'll see the first. And he said to them in his doctrine or in his teaching, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and the utmost rooms at feast, which devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. These shall receive a greater damnation. So, Having interacted with the scribes and the Pharisees at this point, Jesus is done with them. He turns to those who are listening and he's teaching. I still think he's in the Temple Mount area, probably in the outer court or just in between the, 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 the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women uh, where the offerings will take place. We'll see in the next story. Jesus is instructing them. He's teaching them. He says, guys, I want you to beware. That's a strong word. I mean, be forewarned. Take note. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Because what you're looking at, which you might think is a true disciple, is not. What you think is a true disciple is not. They're a bunch of frauds. They're a bunch of fakes. When I talk about giving your all to God, I don't mean look at these guys and try to emulate them. These guys called the scribes these religious elite, these guys that just kind of, that just like when they walked in the room, everything, oh, there's a holy man. No, that's not what being a true disciple is. These were pseudo-followers of God, followers of God in, in name only. And all that they were doing, everything Jesus explained, was not a keeping of these first two great commandments, but it was a breaking of these first two great commandments. Jesus first pointed out that they're breaking the first commandment, in that they're not loving God, they're loving a whole lot of other things that have to do with themselves. Rather than loving God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength, you know what they loved? They loved it when people recognized them as being a holy person. And to do that, they would wear their robes really long and tassels that, that drug the ground, and they would wear this long prayer shawl that was really long and ornate and had tassels that were all over, and they would wear it with them. And whenever they'd go out in public, they would be dressed in such an ornate way that everybody would go, oh, there's a guy who really prays. There's, oh, there's a true disciple. There's somebody who really knows God and is devoted to God. And they loved it when they would walk through the marketplace or they were walking on to, toward the temple, that you would stop and you would become very reverent in their presence, maybe look down, and you might even call them rabbi or master or teacher. You would acknowledge them because of, of just how holy they dressed and how they presented themselves. And that's what they loved. They desired that for themselves. They wanted to be thought of as a true follower of God. They loved when they went into the synagogue. 
that people would part out of the way. Typically in a synagogue where Jewish men would meet, there would be chairs along the wall and there'd be an altar or a box up front that held the scrolls that men would read from and there were chairs behind that, that altar area and they loved it when, when they were, come up here, come up here and have these seats. This seat's for you. This is where you're going to sit. And they would wear their fancy church garment and they would come in and they would take their place and they just thought, look at me. They loved themselves. They loved that religious attire and they loved to be acknowledged in that way. Rather than loving God, their actions revealed that they loved themselves. But their actions also revealed that they really didn't care much about people it says here in the text, and Jesus said, not only did they love these things and pursue these things and give themselves wholly to it, even by the way they dressed and how they carried themselves, but it says in verse 40, think about this, they devoured widows' houses and for a pretense made long prayers. I mean, they would get up and just pray and pray and pray out of a pretense, but they really didn't care for the people they might have even been praying for. They prayed pretentiously. The phrase devouring widows' houses is an interesting phrase. And several commentators and commentaries tried to explain it and compiled this list. And maybe all of these things were actions that they did as a religious person trying to care for widows. See, they, they may have accepted payment from widows for legal aid and or advice even though it was forbidden by law for them to, to do that. But in a sense, hey, if you want my help and service, I know you're a widow and you don't have any standing. If you need somebody to plead your case, in a sense, be an attorney for you, pay me under the table. Or they may have cheated widows as their role as guardians of their husband's estate. So men would say, hey, if I pass away, would you help my widow, because she has no legal standing in the community, would you be the executor of our estate? And so who would you look for? You would look for people who are very religious and very God-fearing, right? These guys, these scribes. And they would become the executors of an estate, and the man would die, and then they would just swindle the, the estate away for themselves, not caring about the family that was left behind. Or they may have been, in a sense, a sponge of the hospitality of the widows. Uh, the, hosp the, the widows would have, in a sense, recognized these men as holy and invited them in, into their homes or, or to honor them as an honored guest, and they would have just lapped it up and taken everything they could have gotten. Or maybe, maybe they just mismanaged the widow's estate through carelessness and just really not caring about the decisions they were making. Or they may have been taking money in exchange for their long prayers. If you pay me, I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll mention your name. I'll mention your need. I'll mention your cause. And God might hear you because after all, I'm so spiritual. Or that they may have taken houses as pledges for debts that couldn't be paid. Literally devouring the widow's house. Taking it for themselves. Not caring about the fact that this widow is going to be destitute and homeless. All of these things may have been actions of the scribes of that day as they just did not care for their neighbor. These scribes were not, these scribes were taking advantage of the vulnerable and not caring for the needy widow. Who were they looking out for? Again, they were looking out for themselves. Kind of reminds me of the tenets of the vineyard that began this, this chapter, right? They weren't really concerned about, about God and bringing Him glory with their work. They said, as the son came, instead of loving the, the, the servants that came from the master, or instead of loving the son that was sent, they didn't, they didn't love God, and they certainly didn't love the messengers who were sent. They didn't keep either of these two commandments. They wanted that vineyard for themselves. They were all about themselves. And that's the kind of servant they were. That's the kind of disciple they were. Even reminds me of the rich young ruler, who just a couple chapters earlier, when Jesus confronted him, Ultimately, Jesus whittled it down and got to his heart. And he says, I tell you what, guy, go sell all you have, come follow me. It's a real test of whether or not you love God most or if you love something more than him. Certainly that man went away sorrowful because he loved his riches, he loved his treasure. Just like these men, these scribes, loved that preeminence and that place in their community. 
this first and dangerous illustration that Jesus says, beware of these guys. Beware so that you get, get, don't get taken by them, but beware that you, that you don't think that that's what true discipleship is. That's not a true disciple. Beware of that. Well, what, I, what, what were they? Who were they? What, what were they doing? These men were selfish. These men were greedy. These men thought of themselves. They loved themselves more than anything. And they used religion as a pretense to get ahead. Did you get that? They were just using religion as a pretense to satisfy their own selfishness. It wasn't a worship of God. It was a worship of themselves. And for that reason, Jesus said, they have a greater condemnation. Not only are they, I mean, they're not like the pagans out there who just live for themselves instinctively, but they're using the temple and their position and, and their religion, and they use this, I'm a follower of Jesus. They've got the fish sticker on their bumper. They, 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 they've published themselves in the shepherd's guide, right? So that everyone knows, I'm a Christian businessman, and they use that Christian term, I'm a follower of Jesus, not because they care of people and not because they care of God. They use that to get ahead because they love themselves and jesus said beware so that you don't get taken by him but beware so that you don't think that those outward actions are truly what discipleship is we need to consider that illustration but i'm thankful that that's not the example he gives for us there's another example pastor what does it look like for me to be a true disciple let's continue and look Verse number 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and said to them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which cast into the treasury. For they... For all they did cast in their abundance, but she of her want or lack did cast in all that she had, even all her living. As Jesus concluded his teaching, he sat down and began to observe what was taking place in the temple that day. Mark tells us he sat there in such a place where he could see uh, quite a show. During the Passover, something that was, became somewhat of a tourist attraction was coming to the temple area and watching people who traveled from afar, watching them give their offerings. People didn't always come up to Jerusalem, but they were required by law that when they did come, and particularly at Passover, they were supposed to be there, that they were to give their tithes for the support of the temple, and the religious uh, rituals and so forth, to support the priests and Levites throughout the year. And so um, wealthy individuals from all over, in fact, everyone was supposed to come and bring their tithe during that Passover time. And the community turned out to see the show. There were 13 offering boxes scattered throughout the court of the women, and they had somewhat of a trumpet or a flare, just kind of a wide opening that funneled all the coins down to a box. See, if if I, in an agrarian society, if I had a big ranch out in the northern Israel, I wouldn't bring all my cattle to Jerusalem. It it would get kind of messy. It would be a much difficult journey. But I would take my firstborn or whatever, my my tithe, a tenth of my my resources from my farm and my ranch, I would sell it in my community, and I'd bring the treasure. And that's how I'd present my tithe. That's how I'd present my offering in that that ritual or or, or cult, in a sense, the the spiritual setting is how they would do that. And so they would bring their offerings and they would give and they would cast the money into the trumpet mouth and it would go into the particular box for the various types of different offerings that they had, whether it be a a livestock or a, a grain offering or an oil offering or whatever type of offering it was. It was a spectator sport. I mean, people showed up for this. And it kind of goes right along with the people he just described. The people who, from their external actions, wanted to gain the applause of people. Imagine the oohs and ahs of the scribes when people came with their offerings, right? I came with an offering today. Hopefully it doesn't bust and shatter and you remember that more than the offering as people would take out of their treasure boxes the offering that they would give. And it would jangle, and it would discontinue. And people were just excited. 
Ooh and ah. I want to hear some oohs and ahs here. Right. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, for, just for the Lord. Just for the Lord. They would take their offerings and they would, they would cast it in the offering. He said in verse 41, many rich, they cast in much. They cast in much. But the, I mean, this, this, these, two, these, these two stories are just a wonderful contrast between the scribes, who's all about themselves, and the next person in our story, Jesus identified. Jesus saw this widow. The only way he knew it was a widow is because he's an all-knowing God. Maybe no one else in the community knew it. We don't know where she traveled from. She might not have been local. She didn't have the rich treasure boxes that people were carrying from afar. She certainly wasn't going for the ooze and all. She's probably embarrassed that all she had in her own possession were two mites. Two mites were pretty insignificant. Doing a study of what two mites are and ultimately making a farthing, two of them together, it was about one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. Not a whole lot that she had put together. Think, think about, like, how much do you make in six minutes of work in a day? How much? Somebody who makes $10 an hour and works eight hours a day, they make $80 and $1.25 an Everybody else, think about this, giving their annual tithe at one time in the Passover, people are dropping in 5,000 and 6,000 and 7,000 and 8,000 and 90,000. Know, they're, they're dropping in lots of money. There's lots of oohs and ahs. I mean, their tax report at the end of the year they get from the, 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 their, their synagogue was, I mean, they were pretty impressive. All the money they made, a tenth of all the money they made, they gave. Look at that. What did she have to give? Dollar twenty-five. What does that look like in comparison? That's not much. Text doesn't tell us, but I kind of imagine she probably tried to come in unnoticed. She wasn't trying to gain a crowd. She wasn't looking for applause. She just had two mites. I don't know what offering box she found, but she found one. She turned and walked away probably unnoticed by most but not by Jesus Jesus knew her story Jesus knew as the text says that those two mites was all she had it was her whole livelihood it, it, that doesn't mean that she went home she didn't have a house but what it means is she had no money in her pocket to buy dinner that night for her to have any more money, she had to go out and work some more just to su sustain herself and to supply. She, uh, she came and gave. Why? Why would she do that? I mean, I don't know that, I don't know that anybody would have made a whole lot to, because she was poor. It's probably obvious. Everybody knew she was poor. She was a widow. She might have had great debts. Maybe it was even her house that one of the scribes had devoured. It doesn't say that, but the connection of these two teachings might imply that. She was poor and destitute. She didn't have to give. In fact, Albert Edersheim, in his book, and he writes his, about the history of the Bible times, in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus Christ, he stated that two mites was the minimum allowed offering. You couldn't give less than that. Why did she give all that she had? Well, there's only one answer to that. She wanted to. She loved God. She loved God more than life itself. She loved God with all of her life. And on that day, in that moment, 
with no fanfare, with no applause. She demonstrated her love for God. She demonstrated that he was number one in her life, not for the applause of men, but for him, for him. As I thought about that story, I thought, here's a wonderful illustration. God, thank you of somebody who loves God with all, who gives God their everything. Unlike the scribes who did this, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm a disciple of God, excuse me, they weren't disciples of Jesus, they were disciples of God, I'm a follower of God, I love God, but really what they loved was themselves, just the opposite. Here's a picture of someone who really loves God and wanted to be a worshiper of God on that day and demonstrated her heart for God in her worship, not for the applause of man, not for the use and ahs, not to be a witness to the lost, not for any other reason, but that God would be honored with her action, friend, in that moment. She became an example to all of us. She defines a person who loves the Lord God with her heart, with her soul, her mind, and her strength. She was the model disciple why? Because she put God first. She put God before self. In verse 43, Jesus called the other disciples. Because again, everything I just explained to you, the disciples wouldn't have picked up on. But Jesus knew because he was God. Without stopping her, without patting her on the back, without calling attention to her or making her more embarrassed, she just gave her two mites and she went on her way. We don't know anything more about her in that sense, but Jesus called the disciples over. I'm sure they were enamored with all the oohs and ahs of the guys who were bringing the treasures and, and they had a lot of wealth and they were giving a whole lot and they were probably astounded by what was going on. And Jesus says, Psst, guys, come here. Don't, don't look at those guys. They're giving out of their abundance. It wasn't wrong that they were giving. They were being obedient to the law. But I really want to show you what following Jesus is all about. Look at her. Look at her. Beware of the scribes, but look at her. There's an example to follow. What a stark contrast we have. Jesus calling our attention, along with the disciples, to this act of the widow who gave her two mites. In Exhibit A, we have a person who lives for themselves. In Exhibit B, we have a person who loves God. Can we move on then to application this morning? Let me ask you this question. If Jesus were to point to your life today, would you be Exhibit A or Exhibit B? Are you more the first kind of example or are you the second kind of example? Yeah, well, wait a second, preacher. Um, I'm not wearing robes today, right? I'm not looking for the seat on the platform today. Um, I, I'm not devouring widows' estates today. I, I'm not doing those things. Uh, uh, and I'm not, maybe I'm not a widow today. And, uh, you know, after I gave my offering this morning, I, I still plan on going having lunch this afternoon as soon as you get done, you know, right? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm having a hard time identifying with either one of these, these two types of people. Well, let's, let's think this through this morning real quick. What, what type of disciple are you? That's the question. You say, well, pastor, I'm... I'm, I'm a working husband. I, I get up. I go to work. I put in long hours. I wish I could spend more time with my family. I come home for, exhausted from work. And, and to be real honest, I, I don't feel like doing anything when I get home. And I know you've got sign-ups for the lawn care team out there. But I just, on the weekends, I just crash. I'm just so exhausted. I work all the time. I, man, I, I, I'm sorry, but pa Pastor, I'm, I'm not sure I can even help with some of those basic things, even that like that around the church. Or maybe you're here and you say, I'm a housewife this morning, Pastor, and, and uh, man, I, every day there's a new pile of dirty clothes. It's in one of the bedrooms or it's in all the bedrooms, and, and, and I, I work hard, I try to take care of the family, I try to keep the, but it's always there, it's a job undone, it's always going on, I'm always after it. What, what does a true disciple look like there? I don't know which one I am. Maybe you're single again, hopes and dreams of marriage have been shattered. You're trying to fit into a church culture, and here we're talking a series in Sunday school about how to maintain marital relationships. Hey, Matt, Pastor, this is hard. I'm not sure. Where do I fit? What I long for and hope for, it didn't happen. Will there ever be normal again? Maybe you're in your golden years, and you had hoped in your golden years that you'd be seeing a lot of different 
sites around the country, but it seems like the only thing you've seen recently is an emergency room. A lot of doctors. A lot of bills. Maybe you're in high school, maybe a senior, about ready to graduate. Exciting time in your life, and everybody keeps asking you, what are you going to do? And you're like, I'm 18. Do I have to figure out life right now? But you feel that pressure of making these weighty decisions, and you hear your preacher preaching out of Mark 12 that you're supposed to give your all to God, and you're like, I'm not sure what that looks like. Or you're a junior high girl, and this stuff just kind of like goes right over your head, and you're like, huh, a disciple? That's what mom and dad are. That's not me. Uh, that's the guy who drives the bus. He's a disciple of Jesus. I'm, I'm just a junior high girl or guy going, trying to make, you know, a passing grade at school. Maybe you're a frustrated pastor, church staff worker, ministry leader. Been working hard, trying to get after it, and it's not always going like you wanted. What does true discipleship look like? Friend, I want to encourage you this morning that every one of those scenarios and every scenario that you find yourself in, it's in that very scenario that God asks you to be his true disciple. It's not contingent on changing your circumstances in order to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. You don't have to chase displaced peoples to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. It's right there in your life you're going to make some choices about how you respond to those circumstances that will tell us whether or not you're a true disciple. In other words, in the circumstance of life that you face, are you living as if you're the center and everyone should be acknowledging and serving you? Or in the circumstance of life you find yourself in, whether you're a widow or not, do you say, it's my actions, my response, is based on my trust in God, my love for God, and therefore now I'm going to choose to worship God, and in that moment you make some sacrifices. Well, what are some things I'm going to be called on to sacrifice in my moment in life, preacher, in my circumstance in life? Can I just highlight a few things? That in American society today, in the Christian Church of America today, here are some things that if we're going to be true disciples, we're going to have to be called on how about pleasure? I, I, like, I like nice things. I like nice days. I like easy days. But if I long for it and live for it and love it, I'm exhibit A, not exhibit B. I, I like vacations. I encourage my staff to take vacations. I think you need to get away and just kind of collect yourself. But sometimes if we're not careful, we just live for those things. We live to escape. We live to be pampered. We live to be served. And if we can't afford to go to faraway places, we buy the biggest screen TV we can, and we regularly go on a vacation about four or five hours a night in front of it because that's where we find our pleasure. Maybe it's with our energy. You know, God's given you the level of energy you have and the decision-making power to spend it. And if we're not careful, we spend all of our time, man, we're energized to read all about our favorite sports team in Sports Illustrated or look them up on the website. Or we're energized to find out about all of our friends on Facebook and we'll spend our time and our energy and we'll make our decisions and we'll go for that. But heaven forbid that pastor get up and encourage us to read a minor prophet. Right? I don't have, I'm not energized for that, preacher. To study the Bible? To go out and spend my money on a Bible dictionary so I can get to understand some of these words a little bit better? What? Yeah, your energy. What are you energized to do? Do you spend any energy for God at all? Are you energized for Him? How about this, our time? Time is money. Never been more true than today, right? Time is money. We, 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 I mean, we charge for our time. Don't ask me to come and, and, and give time, extra work, serve here, serve there. I'm busy doing all that I've got going, preacher. I just don't have time to serve the Lord. I've got time to just barely take care of me. Can I, can I just suggest some others? How about this, isolation. 
if you're going to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, I think at some point in time, you're going to have to say, um, maybe a better word would be individualism. I've got to give up my individualism. I've got to care about more than just me and my needs. And I've got to care about somebody else's schedule and their hurts. And my prayers at some point have to go beyond just my stuff to somebody else's stuff. And and for that to happen, I've actually got to interact with somebody at a care group or at a prayer service. Or I've got to catch somebody after church and stop them and say, how's your week gone? Is there something I can pray for? Because, watch this, Christianity is not just about how it's going to help me. That's not the example of true discipleship. A true disciple really is concerned about the needs of the, the church body and other people. And they... They commit time and energy and effort to find out how they can serve one another. They're not individuals. They're relational. Ambition, acceptance, popularity. We can talk about all these as areas we have to be willing to give. Often when we think of the widow's two mites, we think we're going insta- to we're, we're hear a message on money and I'm going to sit on my wall like a preacher you're not getting any more, Right? And I haven't even mentioned that. But you know, as a true disciple of Jesus Christ, can I just ask, are you willing to forgo some possessions so that Dave and Bonnie Jones can go to displace people? Is that a concern of yours? I love God enough. I want to worship Him with my tithe. And and I understand the gospel needs to go around the world. And, 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 and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice something so that people can hear about Jesus Christ and that churches can be established where there were no churches, that people can grow up in Christ-likeness. See, true disciples think about those things and they give up some of those things. You say, Pastor, that's tough. And you made discipleship about, about where I'm at. And you made discipleship about the choices I make. And you made discipleship about the trust I have in God, whether or not I love Him, and I'm willing to sacrifice for him. That's hard. Because we're wired to think about ourselves. Is there any hope in the text that will help me step out and make this decision? Is there anything in the passage that's going to help me kind of repent this day and consider and say, yeah, I'm going to go a different direction? Well, there are. There's two things I want to point out, and then we'll close. Number one is this. While no one else noticed the widow, and her offering. It didn't escape the view of God. Jesus saw it. Jesus was alert to it. And let me assure you today, you make a sacrifice for God, and you may not get the glad hand from the crowd, and you may not get the email from the pastor, but it didn't escape God's record He'll see it. He'll make note of it. And while no one else knows the amount of sacrifice you've made, God knows that you worshipped Him in that moment and in that decision. And I want you to know, God will see that. Well, the converse is true too. You live for yourself. He knew all that about the scribes too. He said, beware of them, and this is who they are. They live for themselves, and they do that religion thing, and it's all about them. But watch this. They get a greater damnation. You see, God takes note of your worship, whether for the good or for the bad. But there's another thing. I think, really, it's the highlight of the passage. It builds up to this passage. And I want you to see, if you've got your Bibles open, I still want you to see this. In verse 43, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow, insert you, in your difficult circumstance, insert you in that decision you have to make about being sacrificial with your time, energy, ambition, possessions, whatever it is the Holy Spirit is challenging you with today, insert you right there, that this person has cast in more than all of those. All of those wealthy people. All those that we are drawn to and we are acknowledging, look at that offering, look at that sacrifice, because she gave her all. 
want to encourage you today. You make a decision to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. You make a decision to put God first in all your life and love other people. Listen, heaven accurately values that gift. See, this is what we heard on earth. But this is what heaven heard. Because she gave all. She gave more than everyone else. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.